On this edition of Independent Sources, transportation frustration. Commuter van owners driven to stay viable in neighborhoods being drastically changed by gentrification. And speed demons or intrepid entrepreneurs, the struggles of e-bike deliverymen. The details coming up. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Your host this week, Xiphus Lebron. It can be hectic getting around the bustling city, especially above ground. Some estimates claim that Manhattan's population is nearly doubled by incoming commuters. Many of the city's ethnic communities have met the demand for quick and efficient commuting by developing their own systems of transport. We'll talk a little bit about one of those systems tonight, the commuter or dollar van. Then we'll take a look at another group of immigrants coming under fire for alleged reckless riding. But first, dollar vans. They've been a staple of daily transportation in parts of Brooklyn and Queens for decades. About 120,000 people use them every day. Yet they're still unknown or misunderstood by many New Yorkers. We talked to passengers, drivers and experts to discuss the history of these vans, why people ride them and what's in store for their future in the face of changing neighborhoods and quickly evolving technologies. It's faster, more comfortable and convenient. That's all we're looking for. I do like, I mix it up. So I have like an unlimited uh, metro card, but uh, this is, I guess, more faster, less stuff, more convenient. Um, the bus takes longer a little bit. If I'm not in a rush, take bus. So I started on Flatbush. I, I started like usually like on Church Avenue. So I was doing the Dada Cab on Church Avenue. Evan Souverain is one of the many drivers along Flatbush Avenue. He began driving the route 11 years ago after losing his airport job. When I say Flatbush is the long routes, we have to start like all the way to King's Plaza, which is, is, the, is the beginning, and to go all the way downtown. When we're driving, we just like the B41 bus, you know. We're looking like, you know, for the customer on the street. We don't have exactly like, you know, a stop. We can't stop everywhere. But that's not as straightforward a luxury as it sounds. If when you pick up in the bus stop, you're still getting tickets for that. So, I'm not gonna say it's an easy job. Technically, it's an easy job, but at the same time, it's a hard job, so you know. Estimates vary over the number of drivers running routes in Brooklyn and Queens. One study claims that there are about 575 vans. Many drivers don't own their own vehicles. They rent vans at weekly rates from bases. When I start to do van, you have to get vent from somebody because if you don't have your own vents, so you went those things like 450, you know, every week. I'm not gonna say it's bad, it's good because if I'm using your name, you have to get paid, right? right. It's nothing is free, right? right? So you have to get paid. That's the way we're doing it. Like we use the company name, which is Color Van. The dollar vans have evolved from Econoline style vehicles to buses that resemble accessorites. These vehicles can carry nearly twice as many people and are more comfortable and easier to board. Right now we got a lot of white people taking dollar van. Whole people, the whole people used to wait for the city bus, so everybody take the van. So. It's not only the buses and the passengers that are changing. These commuter vans are facing competition from services such as Uber. But Evans believes he makes more with his van than driving for Uber. So you're going to see how long it's going to take you to make that $40 from Uber and how long it's going to take you to make that $40 on Flatbush. So the one is more easy, less time for you. I think that's the one you're going to take, right? Evan says the greatest challenge isn't navigating frenetic Flatbush Avenue. It's dealing with how drivers are perceived outside of their neighborhoods. A lot of people always say like, you know, Dalavan is illegal. I don't know why they say it. Everything they ask us to do, we're doing it. They say we have to have a bus plate, we have to have a TLC plate to doing it. We go, we get it. But we have all those things. Why are we still getting tickets from pick up in the bus stop? Souverain believes that the solution lies in Brooklyn drivers getting more organized. He says that their counterparts in Queens have a more structured way of picking up passengers that's been helpful to them. We can have like a communication, talk to each other. 
because if we take an example like as cranes cranes those people doing it the right way they come to the stop everybody stop the first one leave the second one leave so you know they have like a certain way they're doing it but like us on on Flatbush and Brooklyn and Geneva we don't do it like that in Brooklyn we wanted to learn more about the history of these vans in the city, so we turned to Eric Goldwyn. Goldwyn is an urban planner whose doctoral thesis focused on the industry, particularly in Brooklyn. Vianora Vinka tells us more in this report, produced by Dash Henley. The official story is there is a transit strike in 1980. Uh, it's about two weeks, April 1st to April 13th, and um, there was a prohibition on single occupancy vehicles crossing over the East River bridges. There was an opportunity for people either to carpool or to get bigger vehicles and take people across over those bridges. And so this is sort of considered to be the moment where the vans take off. But if you do a little bit of research, you find there are references in newspapers, you know, even into the 70s. So the, the vans are not serving areas that don't have transit access. That is a misnomer. Um, they are serving areas that are, you know, very high demand, very high density travel corridors. So the B41 bus in Brooklyn is probably, you know, one of the five busiest buses in Brooklyn. With the dollar vans, what I found is that on average, end to end was 45 minutes. And so it's much easier to plan your life around a dollar van than it is around a bus. Dollar vans serve West Indian communities in Brooklyn and Queens and Chinese immigrant communities in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. West Indians start in Brooklyn, and then as they get a bit more money, they move out to Queens. Dollar vans have put people through college. It has created a middle class. It has made some rich people. Um, it's not, you know, just full of poor, uneducated folk. With the West Indian vans, what I've found, at least, is that many people are getting on the vans, sort of, let's say, in East Flatbush, and then getting off at Atlantic Avenue to get onto the 2-3 into Manhattan or something like that. Um, so it's part of a multimodal trip rather than a single trip. The Chinatown vans, what they do that is very different than the West Indian vans is they serve complete trips. So if I'm in Sunset Park and I want to go to Flushing, there's really not a convenient way to do that on the MTA. Despite the good they do in these communities, Commuter van drivers have had a hard time with organizations such as the Transport Workers Union. The TWU lobbied the council to pass laws that were really not workable for the industry. Basically what they did is they say, well, how do you guys operate? And they passed a law saying, well, basically, you can't pick up street hills, you have to prearrange service, which they never do, you can't pick up along bus routes, and you have to have a list of your passengers that you carry with you in the car, which none of them did. Uh, and also you have to have approval from the City Department of Transportation on uh, the number of vehicles that you get uh, and also what areas you can operate in. Matthew Doss was the longest serving taxi and limousine commissioner under Mayors Giuliani and Bloomberg. He has seen the sector go from being virtually hobbled by the TWU to gaining some political allies in the fight for their legitimacy. The Institute for Justice um, with the commuter van industry brought a lawsuit against the city and won, saying that it was unconstitutional um, and a violation of the city charter uh, for them to put a cap on the number of licenses, let alone the fact that the council is involved in, in, in approving licenses, which is a whole other separation of powers issue. Uh, Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani at the time, as well as uh, council, former council member Una Clark, whose daughter is a congresswoman, um, really championed the issue for the Caribbean community. And it was a unique situation where um, when the moratorium uh, law came out, the council passed it and the mayor vetoed it. The lawsuit came, they lost the lawsuit, and the moratorium was lifted. But there was still a mess there. There was still an unworkable law. This unworkable law was amended in 2017 when the city council passed two new bills sponsored by the council members Jumani Williams and Danique Miller. These laws made it easier for van operators to obtain and renew licenses, increased penalties for unlicensed vans, and mandated an annual review and improvement report of the industry by the Taxi and Limousine Commission. We've moved closer now to what their actual operations have been. 
Even with these changes, Goldwyn sees a rough road ahead for commuter vans. You know, the vans on Flatbush Avenue are probably not going to be around in the next 10 years. You know, if gentrification process continues and, you know, the economy continues to do well, right, we will have them replaced completely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they will remain strong in neighborhoods where there isn't that pressure of gentrification, right? Like, to my knowledge, Cambria Heights is not attracting a bunch of yuppies. Doss sees a different future. I think we're going to see more commuter van service. It's going to become more fine-tuned and more accepted. The TWU, the Transit Workers Union, has not been as militant against this industry as they were 20 years ago. Ultimately, the best solution would be that all the van operators would be absorbed into the MTA as bus drivers. Um, you would create dedicated lanes just for the bus. Um, there wouldn't be the traffic and the unreliability that plagues the bus currently. And the bus would be like clockwork, and you could really plan your day and depend on it. And these drivers could now get the health benefits, the vacation time, and the better salary. Experts may differ on the long-term outlook for the industry, but as of today, the dollar vans are going strong. For Independent Sources, I'm Viano Ravinka. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll meet a man who is trying to help these commuter vans keep up with the technological times. Thanks for staying tuned. We've profiled the commuter van driver and already told you a little bit about their struggles. Now we'll profile Sue Sani, a web and software entrepreneur who's created a new app called Dollar Ride. The software connects drivers and passengers and allows fleet owners to better track routes and earnings. Here's Sani in his own words. My family has been a part of the dollar van industry since 1980s. I have two uncles who are uh, among the top five operators with the largest fleets in New York City. They started out um, as drivers back in the 80s. You know, they all went from being their own independent drivers to eventually hiring other drivers to work with them and now being owner operators, which they have uh, fleets of about 30 to 40 drivers each. So um, I've seen my uncles go through building a business and raising their families off of dollar vans. And uh, because of that, I kind of call it the family business. You know, now I look at dollar vans as an industry that has a ton of potential, but is missing that technology element um, that can bring it to the next stage. Now, I think there's a lot that dollar vans can learn from when it comes to what Uber and Lyft and Chariot has done, in particular in using technology to make the service more scalable and reliable and safe for everyone involved. But I definitely think that um, dollar vans need to carve out their own niche um, and serve the community of people who are looking for affordable, fast, rapid transit on a daily basis. It was important for us to kind of match the app with what these drivers actually do in real life. So um, essentially a driver, as they drive along a route, they'll see images of the potential passengers along that route. As they, as they operate, um, passengers who want to pay in cash can do so, and the passengers who pay digitally can do that as well. Over 86% of passengers today have and use smartphones. So, um, you know, it's a, a bit of a misnomer to think that just because folks are low income that they don't have an iPhone or an Android phone that would allow them to pay for their fare digitally. The app is built in a way that helps them find more opportunities. It helps them actually find passengers and find where locations around the city where they can um, find enough fares to meet their personal goals for income. But then for passengers, it's really more about transparency and ease of use. So currently today, as a passenger, you have no idea how long you're going to wait when you're on the streets 
waiting for a dollar van, nor do you know when uh, you'll reach your destination once you're in a van. We are providing free uh, fleet management technology through a website where the fleet owner can see where their drivers are at any given point in time. They can understand what their true earnings are as their drivers pick up passengers and collect fares. They are empowered to stay compliant with the laws that govern the dollar van industry. So those requirements include having valid insurance for all of your drivers, uh, ensuring that all your drivers have the proper commercial licenses to operate in New York City, um, and then also just ensuring that there's safety between the drivers, the passengers, and pedestrians. Dollar van drivers and operators are truly entrepreneurs. You know, there probably isn't a better story, an example of the American dream and New York hustle than what you find with dollar van operators and drivers. Many of these gentlemen and women are immigrants. They come from low income communities, but they've picked themselves up by the bootstraps to deliver a service that is needed um, within their communities and within their neighborhoods. And they actually are making a good living off of building that type of business. I've watched my uncles send all of their children to college, uh, buy homes and employ people um, but from first starting out as a driver. So, you know, I'm excited to create a technology that will create more jobs and more entrepreneurs, just like my uncles have been. Still up on the show, why Asian delivery men are being demonized for trying to earn a dime. Finally from us, advocates estimate that immigrant workers from China and Latin America make up about 100,000 restaurant deliveries in New York City every day. These workers, who are mostly men, have turned to e-bikes or motorized bicycles that go faster and further than conventional bikes to meet the high demand. But this vehicle that was supposed to make things easier is now making it harder for them to earn a living. We get the details in this report. Thank you to all the delivery workers for being here to tell your story. Recently, cyclists and the advocates rallied at City Hall, calling for the full legalization of their bikes and for an end to a recent enforcement campaign targeting cyclists. First of all, the city ordinance around electric bikes that banned them. Um, the penalty for the, uh, uh, the summons that are issued is $500 to $1,000 to the worker. Uh, and the bike may be confiscated as well. And so in order to get the electric bike back, the worker has to be brave enough to go pay their fine and get that bike back, which doesn't always happen. Dolly is a doctoral researcher at the CUNY Graduate Center and an organizer with the Biking Public Project. His work focuses on engaging delivery workers and helping them advocate on their behalf. The Biking Public Project started um, uh, a few years ago, um, and it came out of this um, recognition that the bicycling movement, um, uh, especially in New York City, had been driven mostly by uh, wealthier, particularly white and affluent and privileged populations. And that wasn't necessarily reflective of the bicycling community in New York City. There's a lot of immigrants who, who bike. Um, there's a lot of people of color who bike, uh, increasing numbers of women who bike. Um, and so um, uh, it came out of this urge to be like, well, who's advocating Who's, who's trying to involve different underrepresented groups in cycling. The bike's legality is murky. While e-bikes were approved for sale by federal law in 2002, it was left to individual states to legalize their use. And so uh, New York State never did that. And so technically, uh, since electric bikes can't be registered as like um, a moped or some sort of other motorized vehicle, uh, in the state of New York, um, they've never been legal to use, but there's no state law that also criminalizes them. The criminalization happens at the city level. The city uh, passed this ordinance in uh, 2004 to basically criminalize the use of electric bikes, although the electric bikes that are now being demonized and policed didn't exist at that time. 
the ordinance is written in this kind of very ambiguous way where depending on how you understand it, um, the criminalization of electric bikes may apply to pedal assist or not, depending on who interprets it. The vehicle's increased popularity and criticism of their safety have brought renewed attention to the laws. This prompted Mayor Bill de Blasio to announce a crackdown on e-bikes in January. What we saw was a growing safety problem. And I've had a lot of people at town hall meetings say to me that they're concerned, that they want to make sure we address reckless behavior by these electronic bicycles. Electronic bicycles going the wrong way down streets, weaving in and out of traffic, ignoring traffic signals, sometimes going up on sidewalks. There have been zero people killed by e-bike riders here in New York City. Um, the, uh, when we, we talked to the NYPD at this one meeting and we asked them, everybody keeps saying that they're a public safety threat. So what's the data on this? Where, how many injuries are caused? How many crashes happen? And they didn't have that. They, they told us that they didn't separate that data out from the injuries and crashes caused by cyclists. And we know that number is very small. And so if e-bikers are a subset of that, the, there's not a, a widespread public safety threat. Lee and other advocates contend that the steep fines are only hurting the drivers and not the restaurants, as the mayor claims. He was claiming that the restaurants own the electric bikes, and that's, that's actually a myth. Um, almost every single uh, worker we've ever talked to own their own bikes, own their own electric bikes. And so when the city is uh, penalizing um, for electric bike use, they're penalizing workers. Many of them, like Ming Be Li, are older and are at risk themselves. Sala 都能遵守交通规则。A lot of these uh, workers are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they've been doing this for a while. They, it's not a safe job. You're on the streets, uh, you get hit by cars, you might get robbed and assaulted, and you get a, number, a lot of injuries on the job. And so uh, a lot of these workers are like, it's hard for me with all these, my age, all these injuries, to be able to do this job where I'm working all these hours, doing all these miles, um, and to be able to do this job uh, without an electric bike is, uh, is prohibitive. Lee also thinks the news media has a role to play in demonizing these men. We had done a media analysis on stories about uh, food delivery cyclists here in New York City, and in this analysis, uh, we looked at something like 74 articles, and we only noticed that uh, about a quarter of these articles talking about delivery workers even quotes a delivery worker in the story about them. And so largely this, the story, the narrative about the delivery workers was incredibly demonizing. It was saying, you know, they're bad people who are causing public safety dangers on the street, um, that we need to rein them in, we need to control them. And so they're incredibly demonizing, lack context and lack their voices. And so we noticed that when the stories included their voices, um, it's much more humanizing. <laughs> 他说你这个车不能骑要罚款Lee was intrepid, but many other e-bikers fear dealing with the police or the justice system because they're not English proficient or are here illegally. That's where City Council Member Margaret Chen has come in. And they come in, and all the time they come in, they have stacks of tickets. And then there are cases where they got their bike confiscated. So we had to help them, you know, contact NYPD to find out where the bike is. 
and uh, make sure that they know uh, where to go to uh, fight the tickets. Uh, and, but it's really a hardship on them. The mayor announced in April that the city would revisit the rules with the likelihood that pedal-assisted bikes, which go slower than fully motorized ones, will be allowed. Council member Chen supports the proposal. We want to make sure that if the city uh, goes ahead with legalizing the pedal assist, that they also deliver, uh, develop a program to help a uh, delivery worker to be able to convert the bike that they have now to the pedal assist. Lee would like the city to go even further. We're calling upon the city to cease this e-bikes enforcement that severely uh, impact the uh, immigrant delivery workers. Uh, we're asking the city to uh, uh, develop a mechanism to work with the workers to, on, pol uh, on policies to hear the voices on, on policies that affect the workers. Um, the workers have also asked for if there's um, mechanisms for the city to provide um, uh, trainings and workshops on best practices for, for doing delivery work safely in the streets. Lee has his own message for the mayor. For independent sources, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. That's our show. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent minded.